What's going on everyone? Welcome to Shifting Lanes. My name is Hanson and for this video you find me sitting in the 2022 Land Rover Defender 90. This is the V8 model so it comes with a supercharged 5 liter V8 engine and since this is the Defender 90 it has two doors and a super short wheelbase. This one is painted in the Yulong white color with the ebony interior and all in with some add-ons and delivery you can get this spec for $106,710. And in this video, I'll give you my likes and dislikes about this very strange SUV so that you have a better idea before you buy. But first, to understand this Defender 90, you have to throw some logic out the window. There are so many design features all throughout this car that just seem to defy logic or is just downright insane. There are many things that made me go, huh, that's a really weird way of doing things, only to find out moments later that it's actually really clever, or it's just bad design, or it's just the Brits way of getting back to us for wanting our own independence hundreds of years ago. But first, before we get into the strange little details, let's start with the craziest design decision, and that's to fit a supercharged 5 liter V8 engine in a car with a wheelbase of 102 inches. Already, warning bells should be ringing as logic and some historical context states that this should be called the Defender 100 instead. But no, we're gonna stick with the Defender 90 name despite the wheelbase no longer being in the 90-ish inch range like in the past. Regardless, the last time I was in a car with a supercharged V8 and a wheelbase of around 102 inches was when I was sitting in a Jaguar oh F-Type R convertible. It made 575 horsepower, it was a masterpiece, and it made the most glorious sound I have ever heard. Unbelievable. This is the best sounding trumpet ever. This time I'm in the Defender 90, which is making 518 horsepower and 461 pound-feet of torque. This is the most powerful Defender ever made. It has roughly the same wheelbase. It also makes glorious sounds, but this time I'm sitting about three feet higher off the ground, and if I raise the suspension all the way up, add a few inches to that. Having that much power in a car with this geometry feels kind of awesome in a straight line. When you punch it hard, the engine sounds like a brute. You feel the back end squat and it feels like you're gonna take off into the air. Zero to 60 in this 5,445 pound car is done in a physics class cheating 4.9 seconds. But when the road starts to curve, it gets just a little scary. This Defender 90 likes to sway into the corners and it feels slightly top heavy. Now the Land Rover engineers have done a few things to make this feel more agile, like adding a giant thick solid roll bar, stiffer suspension bushings and springs, while doing some torque vectoring via brakes and other magical things with the electronic rear diff. Obviously, this is no sports car, even though it sounds like one. So if the F-Type R is a precision surgical tool designed to carve corners, this Defender 90 V8, this is a wrecking ball designed to go really fast in straight lines. But what's truly awesome and not completely crazy about having a powerful engine in a short wheelbase tall car is when you're off-roading turning circle in this Defender 90 is very tight, making it maneuverable through tight trails. The approach, breakover, and departure angles are very generous, especially when you raise the suspension to the maximum level, giving you an impressive 11 and a half inch of ground clearance. There's also a very helpful visual tool to keep track of how those angles and important dimensions change as you play around with the air suspension. And couple that powerful engine with a two-speed transfer case, which you could engage right here, then you can convert that ability to go fast for something more well-suited for very bad surface conditions, like crawling through rocks or sand. The amount of torque and traction you're putting down to the ground is multiplied. So it now makes complete sense to stuff that brilliant power plant into this weird package but I just get this distinct feeling that you won't see very many $107,000 Land Rover Defender 90 V8s 
hanging around your local off-road trails. Now that's just one strange aspect to this vehicle. We're barely just scratching the surface and sitting inside, you find more strange things going on in here. Now I've reviewed a ton of cars. You get to know different brands approach to doing various things, but this is the first Land Rover I've reviewed and their method to the HVAC and various vehicle controls seems a bit complex, but once you get used to it, it's actually really clever. The two big dials on here show the temperature for each zone, but then there's extra stuff on here like the word push and a seat graphic. Turns out that when you press the dial, rotating it allows you to either engage your heat or ventilation levels for your seat. This is really clever as it eliminates the need for having extra buttons that eat up the space in the center console. And it's also a great prank to play on your passengers because you could crank up the heated seats in the middle of summer and they won't know how to change this readily because they're not used to it. Thankfully, if you go into the screen, there's a seats button on there and you have access to that and you could lower it back or turn on the ventilated seats. But that's not the end of the multifunction dials because there's two buttons in the middle that changes what these dials can do. The one with the fan icon means that when pressed, the right dial becomes a fan speed controller. The button above that, which has a car and a left arrow icon, does not mean press this to make left turns. Instead, it changes the left dial into a drive mode selector. And there are many modes to choose from. More on that a bit later. In the middle top row of these buttons, you'll find a set of defroster buttons. You'll notice that the one on the left has a resistor icon, and that means there's heating elements within the glass that will heat up. If you look through the glass, there's actually very fine but faint heating elements all throughout the windshield. So that should heat up the glass pretty efficiently. And it also makes me wonder how expensive it would be to replace the windshield should you unfortunately get a crack or a chip somewhere. On the left hand side of this control panel, you've got your ride height control, hill descent control, auto start stop, traction control, and a pretty important one, your low range button. To engage it, it's just like any other truck with a transfer case, you have to shift into neutral, wait until the actuators engage, and then shift back out. Overall, this control panel is cleverly designed. There's a lot of features in this car and that would normally lead to a control panel that just has a lot of buttons on it, but they've managed to condense a lot of the important controls into a fairly small package. The cost to that is of course the steeper learning curve to learn where everything is, but it doesn't really take long to understand where to find the key controls. Now, while we're on the subject of controlling different things of the car, the infotainment system is an 11.4 inch touchscreen. The performance is not bad. Swiping left and right, there may be some delay occasionally, but not enough to find it annoying. For the controls that you couldn't find in the panel below, you'll definitely find it here. Like your driving mode features, there's a lot to choose from. And I love how you can create custom driving profiles and call it whatever you'd like. Here's where you can decide which differentials you want to lock. If you want the most traction while in low mode, then lock both the center and rear differentials. You could also tweak the powertrain for a more relaxed setting, normal or responsive. And if you want your steering to be light, medium or heavy, you could change it here. And then there's traction control where you could have less wheel spin, more wheel spin or when you're off-roading. And then finally, there's ride control and you can have it between normal or firm. There's a bunch of these presets and again, you could control it via this drive mode dial and there's things like dynamic, eco, normal, grass, gravel or snow. There's mud ruts, sand, rock crawl. And yes, there's a wade sensing mode in here and currently the max is two feet and 11 inches. That's pretty good. I also love the 360 degree camera views in this car. This is one of the best camera and display combos I've seen thus far. The images are crisp and the 3D presentation is clever. The fly around view is helpful for when you're parking or when you're off-roading. There's even different dedicated views for those different activities. And while you are off-roading, there's helpful metrics on the screen that can tell you what you're doing. For example, your pitch and roll angles. There's a diagram of your 4x4 system and which differentials are locked or unlocked. 
Moving to the driver's seat, the seating position in the Defender is pretty good. And the front seats are some of the most versatile seats I've ever sat on. The range of adjustability is very impressive. You can raise and lower the seat by a few inches and the lumbar support is insanely generous as it can almost lift your back off the seat. And the visibility looking out the Defender is pretty good. As for the steering wheel, it's nice and large and it feels really nice. The interior is covered in this Dynamica suede cloth thing, which is also covering the steering wheel. So feels nice, but I'm not really sure how this is gonna age in the long run. Now looking through the steering wheel, you have a fully digital instrument cluster and you can change the center display by the buttons on the left-hand side of the steering wheel. The disappointing part here is there's no good easy way to toggle through the different information for your center screen. You have to hit the menu button, scroll through the thing that you wanna see, and then exit out of the menu to show it. Why does it have to be this complex is confusing to me. Moving to the second row, there's actually plenty of comfort and legroom back there. There's nice climate control similar to the ones up front, which is great considering there's no windows that you could open back there. And getting in and out of the second row is also not the easiest thing to do. You first have to lean the front seat forward and then press the button to give you more room to get inside. And then you wait and then wait and then wait some more and then you get to go in. There's also no easy grab handle to hold on to, and considering the overall height of the Defender, there's no graceful way of getting in or out. As for cargo space, here's where things get a bit weird again. First of all, the door opens to the right-hand side. This makes perfect sense in a world where we drive on the left-hand side and where the curb is on the left-hand side, but here in the States, our curbs are on the right, and having this door open this way can make things pretty tough, especially if you're parallel parked in a pretty tight spot. But once you open it up, there's a few things going on in here. First, the cargo space behind the second row is a bit on the small side. There's 10 and a half cubic feet of space, which is good enough for a couple of check-in luggage and other things. To the left, there's a ride height adjustment. So this should help you for when you're hooking up to a trailer or when you wanna have a seat or when you wanna get your doggies in here. This Defender seems to be animal conscious. The second row's backrest have a special texture on them. And when you fold the back seat down, the cargo capacity grows to 58.3 cubic feet of space. And this backrest becomes a grippy floor. You can also add a cargo divider and there's hookups on the ceiling and the back dedicated for that. And if you look at the back door, there's a hidden compartment which houses an emergency triangle should you ever need it. Say what you will about Land Rovers, they do make sure you're prepared in the event that something goes wrong. And speaking of things potentially going wrong, I discovered that the battery is located underneath the passenger seat, which is electronically controlled. So I'm hoping that should you run out of juice to start the car, you still have enough electricity to move the seat to get access to the battery. Thankfully, there's also a terminal you can hook up to in the engine bay. So if you need a jump, you can still make your hookups the traditional way. Some other small interesting things that I found in this Defender, there's an extra plastic piece on the driver's side door that when closed, prevents you from opening the hood's latch. This might be a safety thing, but I'm not really sure why that blockage needs to be there. If you know more about this, please let us know in the comments. The headlight switch in this car is also interesting. Rather than a simple dial that turns to whatever setting, the dial returns to the normal position. And the only way to tell what your headlights are doing is by looking at the instrument cluster. Another interesting design decision is to move the volume dial to the right-hand side and very far away from the driver. Maybe this is for the passenger to use, considering that the driver has their own volume dial on the steering wheel, but that's just interesting to see. Aesthetically speaking, the Defender 90 is one unique looking SUV. It looks like a big toy with its 22 inch wheels, short wheelbase, and very simplified two box design. And I'm completely in love with how it looks as it looks like nothing else on the road right now. 
The front end looks more docile and a lot less angry compared to other Land Rovers you can find today. The boxy headlights and the round daytime running lights is a nice throwback to the original Defender design. The side profile looks luxurious and modern with its all glass-like appearance above the belt line. And at the rear, the full-size spare wheel gives away that adventure-ready and rugged spirit of the Defender, while the quad exhaust tips warn others that they might lose in a drag race. So I've had a lot of fun driving this Defender 90 V8 this week. The engine is raucous and sounds crazy and the interior is quirky and weird and I just love the way this vehicle looks. I want to hear your thoughts on this so please leave your comments down below. And just like always, if you found this video entertaining or found it helpful, please consider giving us a like and then hitting that subscribe and that notification bell so that you could be notified anytime we make a new video. Let's wrap it up right there. My name's Hanson. This has been the 2022 Defender 90 V8, and I'll see you in the next one.